Hello and welcome to the Armenian News Network Rung. I'm Aspet Bedrosyan and I'm here with Hovik Manucharyan. This episode was recorded on March 15, 2023. In this Conversations on Grung episode, we'll be talking about last week's protests in Georgia upon their parliament's passing of a law on foreign agents and what it means for Georgia as well as Armenia and the region. To talk about this, we are joined by Johnny G. Melikian, who is a senior research fellow at the Orbeli Center for Analysis and the head of the Center for Political and Legal Studies. He has worked as a consultant for the International Crisis Group and was a visiting fellow at Georgia's Ilya State University. Johnny Melikian, welcome to the show. We've been looking forward to talking with you. Hello, Johnny. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be with you to discuss uh, interesting processes in Georgia. Thank you. Let's dive into our topic. On March 7, the Georgian parliament voted into law one of a couple of drafts of a bill that had been circulated for the last few months. One of the bills was a near exact translation of the U.S. law on Foreign Agents Registration Act, known as FARA. I'm not entirely sure which draft was advanced, but this law would require political actors to clarify their foreign funding sources and their activities to lobby lawmakers with this funding. The bill narrowly passed with 76 out of 150 votes in the parliament, and it ignited large protests in Tiflis. And on March 9, the parliament agreed to rescind this law and to release arrested opposition members. Johnny, can you explain the nuances of the bill that was passed and why the two sides were so polarized about this issue? So uh, from the beginning, we should say that uh, the situation in Georgia was already polarized. It was a tough domestic political situation and uh, probably the state is under such crises each year. So we remember mass demonstrations in 2018, 2019, in 2020, probably because of pandemic, uh, it was more or less calm. But that year, they had parliamentary elections. Uh, and after parliamentary elections in 21, it was already started the domestic fight between the ruling Georgian dream and opposition. So in this case, it was very interesting that this last two years was a attempt of interference of Brussels to put sides of the domestic politics of Georgia, Georgian dream and opposition behind the round table and to discuss with them the situation of dialogue. Yes. And Charles Michel was trying to do that, but he failed probably. So in this case, uh, especially after the beginning of Ukrainian war and that crisis, the pressure on Georgian government was going high. Mm -hmm. So despite they chosen Kiev, they assisted Ukraine politically, humanitarily. They helped Ukrainians who moved to Georgia, helping them with money, food, etc., etc. But some steps haven't done by Belisi, and one of them is to transfer the, uh, to Ukraine their weapons, ammunition. And another issue was the issue of sanctioning Russia. So Georgia joined Western sanctions against Russia, but the Georgian government said that it is counterproductive to use Georgian national sanctions against Russia because they have a very uh, deep economic cooperation and the last one and a half year, probably there are very good positive dynamics in the economy, foreign direct investments, uh, foreign trade with Russia, so money transfers, etc., etc. So in this case, Georgian government said that there are some issues which are national interest of Georgia, and Georgian government helping Ukraine, being part of large West, they are limited to do some specific things because of their national uh, security issues. And probably, yeah, to be a realist, they have common border, they have territorial issues with Russia, and there is a problem of territorial in integrity, yes? Yeah. And for them, for Georgians, all of their uh, state main documents, yes, it's a foreign policy strategy or it's national security strategy, 
in each of the document, Russia is fixed as an aggressor, as a foreign trip. So in this case, for them, it was very strange to be more provocative, more... Uh, Inflammatory? Yeah, with Russia. So in this case, that's why we saw during the last year that pressure inside the state by NGOs, mass media, opposition, and outside. Europarliamentarians, uh, congressmen, uh, some politicians, or some ministers, etc., etc., were making some statements. And probably the result of the Saakashvili issue also was additional problem for Georgian yeah. government. Because yeah. Their uh, straight position not to release him and uh, to keep him in jail or in hospital, probably where he is now. So uh, this complex of issues was pushing Georgian dream to be more proactive. And in summer last year, part of uh, members of Georgian dream decided to leave a ruling party and they formed People's Power Political unity. So since that period, they started to write open letters where they targeted U.S. Ambassador Kelly Degnan, saying that she's trying to push government to open second front against Russia. And uh, probably in this team was the initiator of this, this uh, draft law. But probably it should be noted that it was two different draft laws. One was moderated draft law on fixing foreign financial influence. So where non-commercial NGOs, such as organizations, to feel to be uh, added in facial uh, register, which will cre will create it uh, under the Minister of Justice, and they should be written if their yearly budget or more than 20% of their budget during the year if the money was coming from outside. So they, as a foreign financial influence, they should be in this register, and they had to yearly present uh, some special a financial document showing their spendings, yes. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, when started uh, pressure or some criticism from domestic organizations, embassies outside of Georgia, the same team, People's Power, they decided just to take American para to translate it into into Georgian and. Uh, mm -hmm as a second draft law to uh, register it in the parliament. So for them, priority was first draft law, but they brought the second one to show that, yes, we have this one, you criticize it, but this is more tougher. So here, physical personalities also should be... Uh, like modeled after the American law. Yeah, here uh, it was just for that to show that the draft law which was prepared by them was mild and it was not against human rights, yes? Yeah. But to be honest, they were hurrying up. Uh, they discussed uh, this first draft law, yes, uh, during two or three days in parliament commissions, mm -hmm. March 2, March 6, and on March 7, they passed it uh, during the first hearing. And this brought more criticism and people go outside to fight for the future European future of Georgia. Yeah? And now some uh, politicians from ruling party, they also say that probably their informational campaign was not so good. They failed in that. After the second draft law brought to the audience, uh, many people didn't get why it was, which was the main idea, or who should be obligated to uh, be part of this law, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it was very interesting that uh, during the mass uh, demonstrations, even students were coming there and telling, or oh, if we will get uh, 
foreign uh, finances to go outside for a study. So we also are agents. <laughs> so probably it was showing that uh, probably more than 90% of people who were outside on the streets fighting against this draft law haven't read this draft law, probably. But uh, media, NGOs, political opposition parties, they brought their fake descriptions, changed the main ideas, and uh, this provocative activity was very successful, and it brought to that hostilities on the Georgian street, yes, in Rustavele. So let me take one quick step back, Johnny. Some, of course, have chided the opponents of the bill by saying that if such a law is acceptable to the U.S. or in the West in general, then why isn't it also a good idea in Georgia? Meanwhile, the opponents have said that Georgia already has laws on transparency, and this law does not fit with Georgian constitution or laws and stuff like that. What do you think? Do existing laws adequately cover what this law would do, or was it mostly a messaging failure by the government? I think it was messaging failure by the government. Yes, NGOs, they are some procedures. They give so so uh, that law on NGOs also is uh, stating that they are obligated to be transparent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So each organization whom they are criticizing, probably on their website, they put their sponsors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if you want to target some NGOs, you can go to their website and say, "Oh, your finances are coming from this state or this agency, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. But here, uh, I guess, was one step further to maybe in the future to target these main uh, uh, NGOs who are probably in each cases, in each uh, topics, from Saakashvili to reforms agenda, etc., etc., against this government. Mm -hmm. So maybe they were thinking that after this uh, law will be uh, uh, adopted, Maybe they will use this law in the domestic so-called war with this uh, NGO sector, yes? And that's why these NGOs, main NGOs, understood the idea for what it was this uh, everything prepared and uh, started to use their uh, lobbying opportunities inside and outside to push Georgian government. And probably the result was positive for them because Georgian Dream decided not to send this draft law to Venice Commission, even that they are okay with the second hearing where opposition failed this draft law. So here, the main factor, I guess, it was the youth, which was on the streets. And most of them, they were not politicized. Probably, maybe they were not aware about it about this process. They haven't read this draft law, but they heard that somebody, government, is changing their pro-Western orientation to Russia. I see. And they just decided and go outside to fight for their European future. So, but in Georgian realities, if such a mass demonstration where there are many youngsters, it's unpredictable. That's why I guess it was for government very huge uh, and very tough decision to go one step back. But they had to and it was I guess right decision because also they presented this step as a investment into depolarization of Georgian domestic politics as a step forward to their opponents, uh, to show to Brussels today that they hear them, uh, etc., etc. So here they, they were trying to show that we are not changing our direction. But we wanted more or less sovereignty inside our state, probably, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for them, I guess, it, this idea was the most important. Johnny, uh, the main backer of the bill was, uh, as you said, the Georgian Dream Party, uh, or specifically a, a party that splintered from it called People's Power. 
Uh, and the main opponents, as you mentioned, were the pro-Western opposition parties who were heavily supported by Western NGOs. Many of them would be targets of the law that is being proposed. In addition, to me, it was unprecedented to see so many EU and Western officials openly speak out about this. For instance, in 2020, when the Armenian government was trying to change the law on the constitutional court in order to basically remove several like uh, constitutional court members, EU officials and everyone in the West basically said, well, we have to let uh, the Venice Commission decide. We have to, it would be improper for us to intervene in the legislative process of the country. But in this case, everyone spoke up, you know, and openly uh, almost threatened Georgia. Most notably, the European Council president, Charles Michel, said that the adoption of this foreign influence law is not compatible with the EU path, which is what the majority in Georgia wants. Can you explain how such a law would not be compatible with EU path? Because as we know, Hungary, I think an EU member already has such a law. And just yesterday, we heard that the EU is itself considering a law, I guess, foreign agent or a similar law. So is there any substance to that argument that such a law is not compatible with EU? Or was this like a basically political reasoning and a covert or an overt threat to Georgia? It is a political step, I guess. So they are pushing Georgian government. They see that in this conflict between West and Russia, probably Georgia is staying on the, the position of a Western state, having problems with Russia, and has nothing to do but to uh, be part of this new uh, rule of games, yes. So in this case, now many things uh, are linked with the future of getting the status of candidate to EU. Yes, the main problem started between Belize and uh, Brussels when uh, they, uh, the three associated uh, states, Moldova, Ukraine, and Georgia, applied for a membership. You remember last year, parallel to the war, they decided uh, and uh, brought official papers to Brussels, and as a result of negative activities of some Georgian opposition parties, NGOs probably, Takashvili and his team, Moldova got that status, Georgia not. But Brussels decided also to give Georgia some recommendations, 12 points to be done by the end of last week, and now probably it's this year, so they should fulfill these recommendations to implement some draft laws on uh, the oligarchization. There is uh, also one uh, point which was uh, about polarization, etc. So now probably when we read some statements after this uh, failing of the draft law, many European politicians especially uh, Commissioner also of Arche, yes, said about the need of uh, implementation of this uh, paper. And now Georgian government is telling that they are working on this paper and some uh, that reforms. They are going to finish implementation and that reforms by the end of this year. But some parts of this document it's unreal to be implemented or adopted by only by government. So when we talk about the polarization, dialogue, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, here you should have both sides, yes, and government or majority, parliamentary majority and opposition. But government is saying that opposition is not actively involving in this process. And here, maybe in the future, we'll have interesting situation. So for Brussels, they are pushing for these reforms. Opposition is thinking that they have carte blanche to criticize government, but nobody should push them, but Brussels should push government. And in this situation, Georgian Dream also, by this law, they wanted to to have another mechanism of pushing some (laughs) criticizing uh, NGOs, I guess. Uh, and that's why uh, this situation may be in a future bring some interesting development. So there are some scenarios. One scenario, 
Brussels is pushing both uh, government and opposition to work with each other on the oligarchization law, on other reforms, and this situation in Georgia will be more stable, and they will finish this process, and maybe they will get status of candidate. But here there is a problem. For government, it's okay to get this status because they are preparing for elections, which will be in October 24. And if they will get this status, they will re-elect, probably. For opposition, it's a bad idea to have this status uh, during the Georgian Dreams government, yes? That's why they will push not to get this uh, status, and it will also create some difficulties for government. And if by the end of this year nothing will happen, they also will try to blame this government that they are pro-Russian, they are doing nothing, no reforms, and EU is, isn't granting them this status. That's why they should change uh, this uh, government by uh, snap election. So uh, by the end of this year or in the beginning of next year, I guess something also will happen like these events, yes, mass demonstrations, etc., etc. So another scenario is that Brussels is pushing just Georgian government and opposition is using this uh, and they are getting snap elections. Or if for Brussels, it's not so big a problem to have Georgian dream till the new elections. So they will push on both sides. So these two scenarios, and I don't see any other development in this case. But we see that West is disappointed by Georgian government, by their calm or their balanced position on Ukrainian crisis. So probably I mentioned two points which haven't done by Georgia, anti-Russian sanctions and transfer of weapons to Ukraine. So these two issues are probably worsened situation and put it, these relations in a bad dynamic. So essentially they have themselves a new Hungary, for example, on their hands. Uh, yeah. A more balanced uh, approach, yeah. which they do not want from uh, Georgia. Yeah. Would you say also that the opposition to this law from the West comes because they exercise most of their soft power, their influence in Georgia and the South Caucasus through these NGOs, which they fund, and they do not trust the Georgian dream government to not use it against their NGOs? Uh, I guess, yes. Uh, so they, they, they use their soft power via NGOs. They use <laughs> smart power. We are their politicians and direct links also. So we, we heard many political statements made by EU officials, head of uh, press uh, service, etc., etc. So ODIR, OEC, and, and uh, other structures. So, so it's showing that both levels, uh, from both levels, and that, that they are just pushing not to have such oversight and control, maybe. Yeah. So, Johnny, earlier this week, we asked Hanat uh, Mikaelian if this back down by the government was also a victory for the Georgian opposition. He said he didn't think it was, but definitely it was a defeat for the ruling party. But in general, who won and who lost in this showdown? And is this issue finished? I guess Georgian dream lost from one hand, but they got a new opportunity to reset somehow relations with Brussels, showing that uh, they are actively hearing what kind of messages are coming from Brussels. They are now probably trying to fastly implement that uh, recommendations. For opposition, probably they also lost because the winners of this game was used so they came to bid, and they were not so politicized. It's, it's, uh, there is a very interesting example when Georgian opposition, uh, Georgi Vashadze, is trying to implement their ideas uh, to politicize this protest. Youth was against that. And uh, during the day when they were celebrating their victory, he wanted to 
make a statement via microphone and you said we are upset of politicians go outside so don't stay here so it also was showing that if we remember the public opinion polls probably uh, if georgian dream has up to 30% of assistance united national movement 2022 more than 40% of population during these polls, different polls, NDI, IRI, and etc., are saying that they are against everybody or they have no decision whom they will vote for if the election will be uh, upcoming Sunday. So it's showing that there is a interesting fragmentation in Georgian society. Probably a big part of it is upset of government, opposition, NGOs, etc., etc., and they need something new. But we don't see now in Georgia new political forces, so-called third force, yes. Many political parties uh, were opened, established during these two or three years, but nobody from them had anything real, have done anything in reality to collect or to get this assistance. Yes, and in this case, uh, we see the same situation which was in 2012. So it was black and white uh, picture, Georgian Dream and National Movement. Bidine Ivanishvili, Kalsakashvili. So until now, the situation is the same. And uh, the main challenge of these uh, upcoming elections is whether new forces were established, and they will put the main forces. Yes, the government. Uh, Georgian Dream and UNM into very specific situation or the situation will probably stay the same and uh, these elections will be probably the continuation of fight between these two forces uh, and uh, maybe here is why Brussels is so hardly pushing on the government maybe trying to push them to create coalition uh, prior to the upcoming elections because it's an open uh, question uh, who will be the part of this new coalition if Georgian Dream will decide to do that or how opposition will go to these elections because there are many problems inside the UNM so recently they changed the head of party new one is uh, probably not so experienced but he is a friend of Mikhail Saakashvili and probably is very close to him. So here uh, we see these developments and probably the future of domestic political situation in Georgia for these 18 months is under the influence of Brussels. Whether Brussels do positive some steps to stabilize this situation or some steps will brought to destabilization because I, as I mentioned uh, if Georgian Dream will not get the status which they want uh, it will be used by the opposition and NGOs uh, against this government and uh, another mass protest will be on the streets and we don't uh, know how they will eventually end. Uh, you mentioned Mikhail Saagashvili and that brought me to thinking the Western media heavily covers Sagashvili whenever he was on a protest, whenever he was in, he's still in jail. He's a former Georgian president. He's a current Ukrainian citizen. It's a fairly complicated picture and a person yeah. and possibly, in my opinion, maybe a, a point of leverage by the EU onto Georgia. Uh, do you think he's a factor in this issue? Uh, I guess yes, because he's a tool. Uh, to push Georgia mm -hmm. government. So in this case, probably this government also is very strict on this position not to release him. Right. Or that even not to let him to go outside uh, to, for uh, uh, another activity, yes, to the hospital, etc., etc. So here also with Saakashvili case, I, I see the uh, exit strategy this way. Uh, if in the next elections, some coalition will win this uh, election, then they will decide the future of Saakashvili. Maybe they will release him. I don't know. 
But if, I even imagine that if even Georgian Dream will win these elections with some other political parties in coalition, maybe they will push this issue and it will help Georgian Dream not to show that they are against, but they have to. They have to deal with this. And uh, probably Saakashvili uh, will be there where he is now until these elections, I guess. Uh, and no other options be, be, be before that. Because, yeah, they, they are saying that his conditions, health conditions are very bad, etc., etc. But, but here there, there are many, many manipulations. So he's on diet. So he eats what their family brings. So he has opportunity to bring, and as I know, Polish uh, doctors said that we can come to Georgia and Ministry of Justice said, okay, there is a, no problem, just came and to examine him, and et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, but he is saying that he was poisoned, et cetera, et cetera. And he's trying to put attention on him. And it was interesting that during these uh, months when he was in hospital or in jail, mass demonstrations in favor of him, uh, it, it was not so crowded, yes? And it, for him, it was also shocking, I guess. So when he was coming to Georgia, I think he was not ready to see this kind of situation. Yeah. So yes, he's politically, so he as a politician, if he is an uh, association, yes, if the, some party, United National Movement is associated with him, yeah, they will get 20%. Population was, but if it's about Saakashvili's release, etc., not so much people is going uh, for that mass demonstration. Johnny, uh, you know all of this. We cannot treat this topic in isolation, especially considering the fact that throughout the region, the issue of foreign influence is very pertinent. For instance, in Armenia, we've done studies. We've looked at. The, the number of viewerships, for instance, for uh, media. And constantly, in the, let's say in the top 10, uh, you would always find a vast majority of the most top 10 popular media to be foreign funded. For instance, number one is Azad Utsun, you know, Factor TV and so forth and so, so on. So when we think about this uh, situation in Armenia, how do you think this situation in Georgia will affect Armenia? Do you think there's a need to address this issue in Armenia? And also, is there an appetite by this government or through pressure externally, is it possible to introduce more balance in foreign media in Armenia and foreign uh, advocacy, I guess? In Georgia, in case, uh, as far as that uh, media, uh, which are funding by outside or NGOs, as far as they are criticizing government, there is a maybe, yeah, in Georgian case, in, from the perspective of Georgian, ruling party if there is a need of such a uh, law uh, in armenia probably i don't see such a criticism <laughs> that's why i don't think that somebody will decide to have this kind of law and uh, having in mind that uh, the uh, majority in parliament is has a ruling party so they they have nothing to do with that but in the future if georgia will return to this issue and maybe after the next election if georgian dream will remain uh, at the power and they will come back and implement this kind of uh, law maybe then it will influence maybe us also and somebody will start to discuss it, this issue here but i don't see that now so there is a, a interest here probably on this kind of issue probably this way i can uh, answer this, this question Right. Well, I guess it's, uh, yeah, that's, that, thank you for that. I think that, yeah, you, for, for me, it's very difficult to ask that question in a balanced manner because we do see that, you know, a lot of the proponents of the West uh, and especially people for, from the NGOs after the so-called revolution, so-called development revolution, they went straight to the government or decided to shut up and not criticize the Armenian government. But it was still, I think, important to ask. Now, uh, I just want to go a little bit more into this. You know, the tactics used by the opposition in Georgia were very concerning. We saw on live TV how they threw Molotov cocktails at the police. We saw them breaking public benches in order to sort of make improvised barricades, flipping over cars, uh, et cetera, et cetera. 
Yet all we heard from Western politicians were calls to the Georgian government to ensure the right of protesters to protest peacefully. Uh, meanwhile, if we remember around the same time, there were opposition protests in Moldova. Now, in Moldova, the situation for our listeners is a little bit is the opposite. It's, so, uh, it's sort of similar to Armenia, where the West supports the ruling regime. And you know, naturally, we saw that the West was uh, criticizing the, the opposition in Moldova, or uh, not, I guess, criticizing or supporting the government in Moldova. Let's, let's put it that way. Also, I would like to mention the Armenian protests, the opposition protests in Armenia last year, last summer, when there were days when there were 50,000 people on the streets, and most of it was very peaceful, most of it was nowhere near as violent as we saw in Georgia. But the West, uh, you know, again said, you know, oh, well, uh, some of the opposition were violent, and they didn't criticize the government for their heavy-handed tactics in Armenia. I remember because I was there in front of uh, Marriott uh, protesting, where the protesters were essentially chanting statements related to political prisoners, related to people who had been arrested by the government already. Uh, meanwhile, um, the EU uh, ambassador, uh, Andrea Victorin, was inside praising the democratic uh, leadership of Armenia, so-called democratic. So I wanted to ask, why do you think the Georgian protests succeeded while the Armenian protests failed? Was it a matter of tactics employed? So was it a matter of just like the Georgian protesters being more aggressive and knowing what they want and going for it no matter what? Or uh, was this mostly the factor of Western influence? If the West allows for this protest to go on and then it will succeed. So, so how f- strong do you think is the foreign factor in these protests, in the success, for the success of these protests, both in Georgia, uh, uh, Armenia and Moldova? In Georgia, foreign influence was very high. And not only that, uh, you mentioned about that uh, some provocations, called Molotov cocktails, fire uh, car, etc., etc. So the other issue, yes, firstly I mentioned the youth, which was there. They are very maybe from one side naive, from other side they were just uh, idealistically there and were fighting for their European future. But there were also many provocateurs. And even uh, it was an information that some uh, Georgians who were fighting in the Ukraine went back. And uh, it was uh, information from the Georgian uh, government uh, said that uh, it was something planning to, to be there. And uh, maybe it was also a factor for them not to go farther, just stop and step back with this uh, draft law. because. Uh, they realized that uh, if something will happen there, some youngsters will die, etc., etc., it will create another more complicated situation and uh, which they will not be able to stop. And in the case when they saw and they, they are not so happy with such a, a reaction from Brussels when they used one rhetoric against Moldova and another against Georgia, but they have to deal with this because uh, they are not going to change their direction of uh, foreign policy. So, uh, and they have to deal with uh, Brussels uh, as it is now and trying to uh, assure them that they are working on reform agenda, they are providing stability inside their state and uh, they should be in power because they were elected by these people, yes? And this main idea is probably when Georgian politicians are making statements, they, they, they are probably now saying that some uh, European politicians from Parliament, European Parliament, Parliament, trying to divide Georgian population from Georgian government, which was elected by this population. So. These kind of messages, yes, are showing that uh, in Tbilisi there is a there is a concern with such a rhetoric, uh, such a position. But but they have to to deal with this and to work 
not to dissatisfy Brussels in this uh Well, Johnny, some people have even expressed the concern that maybe Georgia is being set up for a second color revolution if the Georgian Dream Party starts veering too far off course for the EU. Do you see that as a possibility here? No, no, I, I don't think that it was a possibility of having another revolution. But for them, in this turbulent geopolitical situation, having problems inside, uh, it was not so positive thing. And for them, it's better to calm down this situation and to stabilize it and to prepare for this election. Because mm -hmm. uh, elections for them, it's number one issue now. And uh, they, parallel to these uh, reforms and parallel to the process of getting status of uh, EU candidate state, uh, it's uh, the primarily uh, number one issue yeah, for this yeah. moment. So, Johnny, is this issue of the law on foreign agents finished? Is it closed or is it going to come back? Where do we go from here? At this stage, it's closed uh, because they failed uh, during the second uh, readings in parliament where uh, 35 opposition members of parliament voted against it and nobody from Georgian Dream and uh, People's Power uh, voted for that. So maybe in the future, if, uh, as I said, if Georgian Dream will win the next elections, maybe if they will decide or they will think that there is a need of such a law and probably if parallel to that in EU will create something uh, like this and we know that in other states also there are some discussions. Maybe after these processes uh, it will be easier for them to come back to this issue in the future but I expect that it will be not earlier than uh, next November probably because in October, they will have elections. Mm -hmm. Maybe in after that elections, some post-election processes, <laughs> mass demonstration, etc., which is uh, traditional to Georgian uh, domestic politics. But uh, after that, if they will decide that there is a right time and period, and if they will start to work more specifically, more targeted uh, on information campaign, or what is this law, etc etc so not in two weeks as was this time but in a couple of months maybe then they will succeed or not nobody knows <laughs> because everything is linked to these elections how they will win uh, will be they alone or in coalition if alone or possibly if in coalition maybe not because then they will have not uh, political majority because if you want to adopt a law, you should have 76 chairs in the parliament. Now yeah. they have it, but maybe in the next parliament, they will not have that kind of uh, opportunity. Okay, well, this sets up a final interesting three months of the year in Georgia and our region. All right, we're going to leave it there for today. Thank you very much, Johnny Melikian, for coming on the show. We appreciate the time you took to uh, talk with us. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you for invitation. It was my pleasure. All right, that's our show today. As always, we really want you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Twitter and like our Facebook page. Go, go, go. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs>